Welcome back, everybody, to the last part of day two of Event Tech Live 2020. It's our final live session of the day. Posing the question, when does VR actually make sense? I'm delighted to hand you over to Mr. Bob Cooney. Awesome. Thank you, James. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Bob Cooney, and just a little bit about me, a little background. I'm an eight-time entrepreneur. I've been in the experiential entertainment industry for about 35 years, and actually been doing VR since the early 1990s in various capacities. Um, I'm an author of a book called Real Money from Virtual Reality. I'm the host of the Being Virtual show, and I'm a keynote speaker on emerging XR technology um, and how it's going to impact various businesses from entertainment to events to how we show up in the world. Um, today, we're going to go through three basic categories. We're going to talk about what is VR now and in the future and talk about a little bit of the terminology and the technology. Um, I'm going to talk about the use cases that make sense and some of the challenges that you want to watch out for, and then a little bit of a glimpse into what's coming in the future. Um, and so the first thing, let's talk a little bit about technologies. You hear this term XR bandied about. And XR is like an umbrella term for what they call extended realities. And it covers three basic areas of immersive tech. One is virtual reality. Um, and that's basically headset based, right? Where you put on a headset and you're fully immersed into an environment. There's augmented reality or AR, which is when you wear glasses um, and there are cameras in the glasses um, and you see the world around you in real life. And then we, add things or augment that with virtual items. You can also do that now through cell phones. Um, and then there's less, there's mixed reality, which is where best way to think about that is your physical body or an image of it is projected into a virtual environment. Um, and I'm going to touch on each of those a bit later. So the first thing I want to talk about is virtual reality technology. So I'm going to keep it simple. We're going to keep it high level. Um, and there's two basic types of tech that you need to think about in VR. One is there's PC-based um, technology. And we're going to talk about the headsets first. Then we're going to talk about the tracking systems. And so this is um, an example of a PC-based headset. This is the Valve Index, um, probably considered by most the top-of-the-line consumer VR headset. And it's got a big cable and you hook this up to your computer and all the computing is done on the PC. Now, there are some advantages to that. You get some really high resolution. Um, you can create really amazing effects with textures and lighting and shadow. And if you want to do something really high end, you're probably going to go PC based. Um, the other product in that category, the headset, if you want to look at it, Valve Index. The other one is the HP Reverb. Um, they're actually on the second generation of that they just released, um, fairly inexpensive, um, again, PC-based and what we call Tether. Now, for me, the most exciting development for virtual reality, especially in the event business, is the emergence of what we call all-in-one headsets. And uh, the most popular one that you've probably heard of is the Oculus Quest. This is the new Quest 2, the second version of it. Um, and everything you need to do VR is actually in this headset. It's quite amazing. Um, it uses mobile phone technology. Um, this has a Qualcomm XR2 chip in it, if you care. Um, and it gives you near 4K graphics. Um, and the tracking system is actually built into these headsets too. We'll talk about that in a section, in a, sec a second. Um, the other company, now the, the, the Quest has some limitations. It's really a piece of consumer kit. There is a business version of it, which is the same version that you pay $299 for, for the consumer, that's um, almost $1,000. But they give you different software and more control. And if you're gonna be in the event business and you're looking at doing this in a live event especially, you're gonna to wanna to look at the business version of that. There's another company out there that has a product, um, it's called Pico Interactive, and you might not have heard of them. They're actually the second largest headset manufacturer, I believe, in the world right now. Um, and they also make these all-in-one headsets. This is the the G2 or the Goblin 2, super lightweight, um, very comfortable, relatively inexpensive. Um, I think this in volume is maybe three to $350. You might even be able to get it for less than that. And then they have a higher end headset. This is called the Neo 2. 
named after our favorite superhero from the Matrix, I guess. Um, and this is really equivalent to the Oculus Quest in capabilities. You can walk around a room and it has full 3D tracking built into it. And one of the things I like about Pico um, is they're very business friendly. You can, they'll work with you to preload software and ship it out to people preloaded. We'll talk about a use case for that um, in a little bit. And so you've got PC-based headsets and all-in-one headsets. And the all-in-one headsets, especially um, for the event business, I think is probably where you're going to want to focus. Now, the other thing we're going to talk about is the tracking technology. And um, a few years ago, really, the only option you had were these external cameras that would track your body and your headset in space. And this is the most popular one. This is called the Lighthouse um, this is made by HTC and Valve, um, and you put two of these in a room and they use infrared lasers to track you and the headset and your controllers and know where you are. Um, super fast, super accurate, um, works in dark lighting conditions, a bit of a pain to set up um, and to calibrate. Now, the nice thing again about these all-in-one headsets, and I'm going to go to the, back to the Oculus Quest, is this is called inside out tracking. And you can see there's little cameras on the headset. And what it does is it uses a technology called SLAM, um, simultaneous localization and mapping if you care. And what it does is it maps the environment as you move your head around and it remembers it, it turns it into what we call a point cloud. And so it, it, it creates lots of different points in your environment and creates a 3D map of points. So it knows where the headset is and where you are in relation to your surroundings and tracks your movement within it. Super cheap, super easy. It's a little bit less accurate than Lighthouse, but for what anybody I think watching this would do, it's more than sufficient. Um, and the one limitation on it, it does need a moderate amount of lighting level. If you tried to do it in a dark room, you might actually struggle with it. And so, um, so that's the VR tech at a high level. You've got headsets and you have tracking systems. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is augmented reality. Now, there's a lot of buzz around AR. Um, and there's two ways you can use AR. One is, as I mentioned, glasses. And now, if you go back a little while, there was a thing called Google Glass, um, which spawned a group of people that were not so lovingly termed glass holes. Um, and it had a camera in it and it gave you notifications and kind of took some of your smartphone things and put it into your field of view. And it was really early and it was a bit before its time. Google just recently acquired a company called North Focals. And they have a set of glasses that look cool and they're gonna be coming out probably early or mid next year. And they're gonna have full smartphone capabilities tethered into the, um, to your smartphone, into the glasses. And so, and cameras. So the, the glasses are gonna map just like the headset does using slam tracking, that point cloud in your environment and they're gonna know where you are. Um, and so North Focals coming via Google, there's another company called Enreal that has a set of glasses. Um, and right now they're only shipping to Korea, but I expect those to be widely available next year. And so if you wanna play around with some AR tech and see what's, ha what's happening out there, those are the two companies you might want to keep an eye on. Um, the challenge with AR, especially in glasses, is what we call a limited field of view. Now, a virtual reality, our, our peripheral vision as humans generally runs about 220 degrees, right? So if I put on a headset and I have a 220 degree field of view, I'm getting my peripheral view and I'm seeing everything that I can basically see. Most VR headsets run about 170 to 180 degrees of field of view. So you get a little bit of that binocular vision effect, but if you're in it for a few minutes, it tends to go away. Um, the problem with augmented reality glasses is the field of view is really small. I think the best you're gonna get now is probably 70 or even 80 degrees. And it can be like looking at the world a bit through a postage stamp. Um, and from a consumer experience, to be honest with you, it's not amazing. And so be aware of that. If you're thinking about augmented reality tech in glasses in an event, it's probably not ready for prime time yet. Um, what is ready for prime time is cell phone AR. And if you've ever played Pokemon Go, you have a concept of what cell phone based AR it looks like. Um, you know, you'd have Pikachu floating in the air in front of you and the camera would pass through what you saw in the room or on the street or in the mall. 
Um, and AR's gotten a lot better since then. Now that the cameras are a lot more sophisticated, um, it actually maps the room and can place the object on a surface. And some of the better cameras, like the new iPhone 12 Pro that has a LiDAR camera built into it, which is the same basic cameras that they use for autonomous driving in cars like the Tesla, actually can map the room and your AR objects can sense like columns or tables and jump on the table and move around things. And it gets really realistic. Um, and there's companies that have ex been experimenting this with this for a while. You can download the IKEA app and IKEA will allow you to select an item and place it in your room in augmented reality and see what it looks like. And so if you think about showrooming and, and things that you might do at an event and the ability to place an item in, con in context in a real environment, AR could be a really cool way of demoing product. Amazon is also playing with this in the Amazon app. So you can see how a certain product that you might get in Amazon looks in your room on a floor or on a table. So augmented reality is kind of a bit still bleeding edge, but I think in the next year or two, you're gonna see massive improvements in that. And as far as engagement goes, I think there'll be some really cool ways you'll be able to engage people at events or in virtual events using their cell phones and augmented reality. Now, last I wanna to touch on really briefly is mixed reality. And this is, like I said, think about your body projected into a virtual environment. Um, and there's three basic technologies there that are coming. One is um, projection mapping, which is out there now. And projection mapping allows you to take a, a physical real space and using high definition projectors and depth sensing cameras, um, it projects and maps a video onto a 3D surface. So it really looks real. Um, and so if you're building physical spaces or physical exhibits, projection mapping is a really cool way to change the environment in real time. And it can be responsive to the movement of the people in the room because again, of these motion tracking cameras that are involved. And you'll see this emerge, you're seeing this in restaurants. Um, a lot of restaurants now will have where they project onto the table and when the food comes, you'll see the, the petite chef, you can Google the petite chef online and you'll see a video of a little, little mini chef dancing around the table, walking around your plate and making commentary about your food. Um, the other two technologies that you're gonna see, one, another one's called photogrammetry. And I'd mentioned the new iPhone uh, 12 Pro that has a LiDAR camera in it. And a LiDAR camera is a high-tech um, high laser-based depth sensing camera. And what it allows you to do is map a 3D space. So you'd be able to take an exhibit, for example, and map it with your phone in 3D and create a virtual version of that and then allow people at home in VR potentially actually come into the booth like they were really there in a virtual or hybrid event. So that technology is coming fast and it's gonna have a huge impact on the event business. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is holograms. Holograms are finally real and they're coming. And we'll talk about a little bit about a company you might wanna follow there, but you're gonna be able to do holograms with really simple webcams, depth sensing cameras, um, and computers from almost anywhere soon. Now the last piece of the puzzle, so that's all the hardware tech. The last piece of the puzzle you have to think about are the software platforms. And, um, and there's two types of platforms I'm gonna talk about for virtual reality. Um, one is the fully immersive 3D VR platforms. And the beautiful thing about VR is it gives you a real sense of presence. If you haven't done VR, you gotta try it. My recommendation is get a $300 Oculus Quest while you can, they're gonna sell out for Christmas. Um, and there are some great platforms you can download and test it yourself. There's no excuse not to have one now. Um, and, but you get that real sense of presence. I did a, a test of about 50 different VR platforms earlier this year, looking at the event business and what might work and what might not work. And one of the things we found is even if the avatars are a bit goofy and cartoony, you quickly, your brain quickly convinces yourself that you're in the room with another person. And if you're selling, selling or demoing a product, that sense of presence is really important. The other thing that you get with VR that you don't get with any other event technology that I'm aware of is attention without distraction. And we all know that distraction is, and, and engagement is a big challenge. Distraction is a challenge. People are on their cell phones. They've got multiple browser windows open. They're looking at their email. Who knows what they're doing, right? When you're in VR, cuts out all the distraction and you're fully present. And so there's a lot of value as an event organizer or as an event promoter 
or frankly, as a salesperson or a speaker, knowing you have the attention of your audience and VR delivers that better than anything. Um, some of the challenges with virtual reality you want to be um, aware of is after about an hour or so in a VR headset, it can actually get a bit tiring and uncomfortable. Um, uh, there is a bit of eye strain. Um, some of the headsets don't necessarily fit very well. Some of them are heavy. Again, they're getting lighter and they're getting more comfortable. But right now, I wouldn't expect to put somebody in a VR headset for a half a day or a full day event. Um, the other challenge that I found personally in spending three months doing a deep dive and testing 50 or 60 different platforms is the onboarding can be difficult and confusing. Now, I'm an expert. I have a team of experts. And there were days where we just wanted to punch ourselves in the face trying to get some of this stuff to work. Um, and so if you're working with a casual um, attendee base, be really mindful that friction is not your friend and you want to make sure that you're going to deliver an experience that's easy to use for people. And there's not a lot of that out, of, out there right now. And so it can be difficult and it can be confusing. Now, the other thing that's happening is because VR isn't quite ready for prime time, you're seeing these platforms come out that they're calling 2.5D. It's not 3D, which is VR, and it's not 2D, which is what we're doing right now, video-based. It's kind of in the middle. And basically, you show up as an avatar in a video game. Think Fortnite, right? Um, and one of the cool things about it is it's different, and people get to be a character in a video game, and we all love video games, right? Um, you get to navigate by keyboard or by mouse, and some people who aren't used to navigating in video games can find that challenging. Um, some of the platforms even work on a mobile phone, which is kind of cool. Um, there's two platforms I would encourage you to look at that seem to be best of breed and getting the most traction and able to handle especially scale events. One is called Engage. Um, it, it's called Engage. And the website is engagevr.io. And that one will enable you, again, to build a campus. They have You can build your own environments. They have environments that you can use. Um, and you can do them in 3D, in VR, in 2D, on a mobile phone. And so you get massive accessibility, which I think is important when you're thinking about VR that most people don't have VR headsets now. The second platform I would encourage you to look at is called Verbella, V-I-R-B-E-L-A.com. Um, that's the one I did my first VR speaking engagement in earlier this year at a a conference called um, Laval Virtual, and they had 10,000 people live in Verbella, some of them on a screen, some of them in VR. Um, and again, those are the two platforms, Engage and Verbella, that seem to be doing the most in the VR 2.5D space. Um, and so another option that is now becoming possible, and especially with the comp this company Pico I was telling you about, is you could actually ship a headset to your attendees. Um, this Pico Goblin, depending on what you wanted to use it for, um, is more than sufficient. Um, it's called a three DOF headset, three degrees of freedom, which means that it tracks your movement as long as you're moving up, down, side to side, left to right. If you get up and walk around or lean forward or backwards, it's not gonna track your depth in space. Um, but if you want to have people engage during a really good keynote, or maybe there's a celebrity appearance or some entertainment events, or it's a lean back experience where you just want people to watch, be immersed, and have no distraction, you could probably ship this in a beautiful box to attendees for around 300 bucks, which is less than the cost of a plane ticket or a hotel. And so I think you're going to start to see a wave of VR-based events where, especially for a VIP experience, the attendee gets a box with a headset and all the software is preloaded. And that's the nice thing about Pico Interactive is they'll work with you to preload software. Um, and this way people get it, they put it on, and they're in the event. And onboarding is so critical when you're talking about virtual reality. Um, you know, the other place you're seeing VR really take off is for product launches. Um, they're generally shorter term events. The product is the, is the focus. And a lot of companies now have really good photorealistic 3D renderings of their products. And you can bring them in with um, platforms called like Sketchfab or SketchUp. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and you can bring them into that virtual environment and then people can interact with them, they can look at them, they can walk around them, they can talk to them, uh, to other people about them. A salesperson can even demo them. And so I think you're gonna see VR for product launches or even especially around the media. I talked to Charlie Fink from Forbes who covers XR technology and he kind of half laughs about how many VR headsets he's being sent now for press launches of new products. Which actually brings up a concern that I want to talk about, um, which is a glut of, you know, electronics technology, which isn't really good for the planet. <clears throat> and so one of the things you can do is think about donating after they're sent out. If people don't want to keep them, come up with a program where they can then donate them. You pick them up and send them either to a school or a senior home. Um, and especially senior homes, because they're using VR now to help seniors to experience bucket list items like travel again and combat loneliness and depression. And so you can really do good with VR in the event industry if you think about what's the off ramp for the technology. Um, and so <clears throat> from a, from, so for live events, live in, so those are virtual events, live in person of events. I want you to think AR over VR for now. I think VR, um, it's going to be more for hybrid events to bring the event to them. So when we get back to hybrid event or we get back to live in-person events and hybrid becomes the thing, you'll be able to have people in VR experience the live event a lot more like being there for the 70% of the people who say they don't want to travel for the next year or so. Um, and also in live in-person events, really think about augmented reality using user phones. Everybody has a smartphone. Um, lots of, um, of event companies have apps. You could probably build AR into some of those apps. You can develop your own app. There's even a thing called mobile AR, which will work in a web browser. And so you could do it, make it as simple as scanning a QR code in your booth. It would launch an AR experience in the phone and it's really easy to onboard people and you get scale. Um, and so the last thing I wanna talk a little bit about is what's coming and what to watch. So the platforms, they're a little bit rough this year, but they're getting better fast. They're getting easier to use, easier to navigate, and easier to onboard people. And so, as like, like a lot of things, COVID accelerated the go-to-market for a lot of these companies, and they weren't really ready for prime time, and they were forced into prime time. And they're getting better fast. They're raising a lot of money, and they're hiring a lot of engineers and employees. Verbella and Engage are the two that I recommend taking a close look at. Headsets are not going to get much cheaper. They're going to get better. And so don't expect the price to fall much, but expect the technology to get smaller, lighter, faster. Um, and look at Pico Interactive um, for a headset on the event side is the one I recommend. Over the next couple of years, AR, augmented reality usage on smartphones is gonna become ubiquitous. And so watch this trend for engagement ideas. Um, there's a company um, called River RIVR that does photogrammetry and AR. You can watch, watch them, follow them on LinkedIn. Smart glasses are a ways away. Watch out for Apple in that space. Heavy rumors that in the next couple of years, they're going to um, come up with a product that's going to define augmented reality glasses. And I would probably wait for them before I got into anything that was glasses based in the event space. And inexpensive holograms are going to be huge. And I think this is a game changer. Um, so photogrammetry, the ability to map 3D spaces and photorealistic avatars. I can put my iPhone on a tripod and spin around slowly in front of it, and it's gonna create a 3D avatar of me that's photorealistic. And there's a company called Portal, P-O-R-T-L, that's just come out with a hologram booth. It's 60 grand now, which for an event actually isn't that bad, and people can beam into, it looks like a phone booth, and the, 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 it's, it's mind blowing, the hologram can interact live with people that walk up to it like they're there. And it actually looks like they're there. It's amazing. And it's coming to events all over the world. So check out Portal. Um, so last word, if you're thinking about VR, ask yourself three questions. Why, why, and why? Why are you using it? Think about the friction. Is it easy? Is it fun? Can you, is it on brand? What's the price for the prize? If there's friction, is, it, is the experience going to be worth the friction? And what are you trying to accomplish? Are you doing it because it's cool, it, because it's a buzzword? Um, and that's, that's the question you wanna ask. A lot of people are caught up in the, and enamored with the technology. Keep in mind, it's just technology. 
but it does give you immersion and attention. It's great for VIP experiences and product launches. It's really good for high-end keynotes and entertainment. And I think for hybrid events, the ability to bring the event home to people that won't or can't travel, it's going to be a game changer in the next year or so. So that's the last word on virtual reality. If you have questions, I want to invite you to email me at vrbob at bobcooney.com. You can always reach out to me via my website at bobcooney.com. Um, and if you're interested in more of this, I've got a live streaming show with a bunch of episodes on event tech and, and virtual reality at the Being Virtual Show. Um, and it's beingvirtual.tv is the website there. So I want to thank you for your attention. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. And don't hesitate at all to reach out. And um, if James is there, maybe we can see if there's any questions. Hey, Bob, fantastic session so far. Thank you very much. It's always great to see uh, a speaker who, who doesn't have a PowerPoint or a, you know, a keynote presentation who can just go on camera and speak and engage everybody. And that's what it's been so far. So congratulations and thank you so far for what you've given us today. If you can spare us just a few more minutes of your time, we do have some questions that have been submitted via the, the Glissa platform whilst you've been speaking. So we'll get to those and I'm sure you can give us some, some quick answers on those. So, Firstly, just a question simply about kit. How soon will we see VR and AR in our glasses? Will Google Glass come back? Five years. There we go. Five years, everybody. Well, that, it's as simple as that. Bob, put this date in your it's diary, real. Bob, and we'll see you in five years' time, and we'll connect via <laughs> these. <laughs> yeah, no, look, the um, long answer is... The glasses technology is going to be for notifications and, and simple things first. And then it's going to take, like the iPhone. The first iPhone was a phone and a web browser, and it didn't have an app economy. And it's going to take a few years once the hardware penetrates the market um, for people to figure out how to use it and app developers and platform developers to adopt it. So you've got two years before the product really becomes out there in scale, and then another two or three years for people to figure out how to use it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, are you, con this is a great question, I think, are you concerned about users of virtual reality having multiple reality effects which could affect their mental health? Is that something that's on the radar of, of the developers? Um, I have massive concerns about that and more specifically the fact that Oculus, which is by far the dominant platform both for mm -hmm. hardware and software, is owned by Facebook. Um, and, you know, if anybody's seen The Social Dilemma or The Great Hack or any of the documentaries on Netflix about, um, about how Facebook, you know, treats our data and uses it against us and to manipulate us, I think when you get into virtual reality, you have some real concerns here, but that's the topic of a different conference. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, just want to get your opinion. This is another question that's come in here from somebody who says that they feel um, that VR innovation has maybe reached its peak. Um, which products does the future hold beyond virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality? Where do we go from there if we've sort of reached the peak of innovation with the hardware side of things? Yeah. So what I would, what I would encourage you to do is go back and watch the Steve Jobs original iPhone release. It's on YouTube. It's fascinating. Um, and basically, he went out there and he said, we've got three products we're going to launch today. The first is a phone. And the second, and everybody applauded like crazy. And the second is a widescreen video iPod, and the crowd went crazy. And then the third thing is a revolutionary internet communication device, and there was polite applause. And now, if you think about the innovation that's happened on the smartphone 10 years later, none of us saw Uber, none of us saw Airbnb, because the core technology wasn't available for that innovation. The Oculus Quest is the first iPhone. They sold less than a million headsets. The first iPhone sold about a million handsets. The next version is going to sell 10 million. Within a few years, they'll be selling tens of millions, if not 100 million units a year. We haven't even begun to see the innovation that's going to happen with, with spatial computing yet. And so, yeah, hold on. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's put here, how long before minority report? Um, I, I'm just going to nick your answer and say five years. 
Well, I think minority part, you know, there's two things. One is the ability to do like hand tracking and, and really accurate hand tracking and manipulate computers in space. And I only, I don't think we're five years away from that. I think that you can kind of do a shitty job of that. Oops, sorry. Now, um, I think within <laughs> two years in a VR headset, you'll be able to have multiple computing environments and really accurate hand tracking to manipulate that computing environment. I actually think we're two years away from that. Now, the whole precognitive um, thing of predicting crimes and arresting people in advance, like that's, that's a whole different subject again. Hey, we're not, we're not even going to touch that subject. We're not going there at all. Um, the final Especially thing that we've had come in America, from... Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, exactly. The final thing that we've had come in from Glisser is not a question. It's simply two words. In fact, four words. Amazing presentation. Thank you has come in from one of our attendees today who submitted that via Glisser. Um, and I'm sure everybody would echo that. Bob, before we wrap up, before we say goodbye, we must say thank you. And would you mind just telling all of our attendees where you're tuning in from today? We're in the UK. It is currently just gone six o'clock in the evening, UK. Where are you? What time is it? So I'm in uh, Melbourne, Australia. We're just coming out of lockdown. I know you guys are just going into lockdown. Um, my heart goes out to all of you. It's um, 5 a.m. here in Australia. I'm about to have my second cup of coffee and, um, and catch up on some emails and get to work. So as you guys are hopefully grabbing a pint or a glass of wine, we're just starting here. Well, it's, it, isn't it great? You know, we've got you in Australia, 5 a.m. You've got up, you know, probably pre 4 a.m. to come and join us today, which is great. And we thank you for that. It's the evening time here. It's still just the start of the working day over in the U.S. where we've got people tuning in from. So, you know, as we've said repeatedly so far in the first two days of Event Tech Live Virtual, everybody's adapting to this new way of working, you know. Everybody does want to be in a room with everybody else. It's, it's sad that we've got to miss out on the live event this year. But the huge plus to that is what I've just said. Australia, the UK, the US all joining together and all participating at the same time. Bob Cooney, thank you very much for joining us from Australia at Event Tech Live today. My sincere pleasure. And if anybody has any questions, vrbob at bobcooney.com. We just lo lost Bob there, but that's understandable because he's thousands right. and thousands of miles away on the other side of the world. That brings us to the end of day two of Event Tech Live 2020. Let's look, take a little look ahead to tomorrow before we sign off uh, for this evening. Um, our first session um, tomorrow.